morning and welcome. Glad that you've joined us here today for our Sunday morning. Uh, pray that God will pour out of his spirit upon us and enable us to be everything he's called us to be. I've got a scripture out of my heart I want to share, and then we're going to go to Genesis chapter 45 and then Genesis chapter 50 for a quick little review of a couple of catchphrases uh, that were in Joseph's story. But the scripture is found in Philippians 1.6, and it says, And I am convinced and sure of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue until the day of Jesus Christ, right up until the time of his return. Developing, I want you to think of that word, developing, that good work and perfecting and bringing it into full completion in you. Philippians 1.6 in the Amplified. I remember hearing Joyce Meyer this past week, and I've heard her before share a little bit of her testimony that uh, in her calling to God that she had quit her secular job, her well-paying secular job, uh, to spend time in study in the Word of God. During those seasons, she led a group of 25 people for five years. You think of Joyce now and some of the cru crusades and the, some of the conferences that she holds, they're massive. And then for seven years, she served under another pastor, serving him or her and their vision rather than just her own uh, to see it come to pass. And then uh, for one year, nothing was happening. She was sidelined or preparation for what was next. And I've heard her say this before, but this is like a testing time or a test. You can't have a testimony without a test or a testing time. I think of Leonard Ravenhill, the great revivalist. Uh, Leonard Ravenhill had a sermon called, No, No, It's Not an Easy Road. Leonard Ravenhill was pretty much just saying, this Christian life is not always easy. It may have tests, it may have hills, it may have valleys. But this is Leonard's story. This is Joyce's story. We're going to see this is Joseph's story. But this is your story. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 45 and if you're not there yet, let's pick it up with the first verse. That Joseph could not refrain himself before all that stood by him. And he cried, cause every man to go out for me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brothers. And he wept aloud. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore do not be grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you as a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all his house and ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Now in chapter 50, this is when Jacob, Father Jacob, had passed away. They'd gone through the period of mourning, and then the Egyptians' period of mourning was longer even. And uh, he was buried. And after he was buried, um, Joseph's brothers are worried because now Jacob is gone, Joseph may be holding a grudge, and he may now retaliate. He may come back after us. So they said, our father has written these words in verse 17. So shall you say unto Joseph, forgive, I pray thee now, the trespasses of thy brothers and their sin, for they did it unto the evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespasses of the servants of God, of thy father. And Joseph wept when, he, when they spake unto him, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face and said, Now behold, we be your servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? 
But as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear not. I will nourish you and your little ones and be comforted, uh, and, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. You know that's a process. You begin to see Joseph coming through a process and that he was sweeter and sweeter at the end. Now, I love those two catchphrases. God sent me, not you, that's the first one. And then secondly, God meant it for good. Now, early in his journey, early on in his journey, he cried, get me out of this pit. You know, my promise is the palace. What am I doing here in the pit? And, um, you know, I credit what I'm going to say here with Dr. Don Beasley, who I coached with years ago. And, and Don and I walked and talked through a number of things. But uh, many Christians are tempted to request or order their life. Give me life without the pits, please. Uh, that's my preference when I order life without the pits, please. This is how we look at the difficulties presented with the pits in our life, because they may seem wrong or perhaps only in part. That's when we may see them wrong or only in part, not fully developed. We opt for the removal from our life. I contend for and suggest to us that a better approach would be to trust God and his leading and allow them to be fully developed. Then we'll be able to see the rest of the picture and the completion of the process. So uh, let's allow these images to fully develop, revealing many turning points in our lives. Now, remember sometime back, we talked about significant snapshots in our lives. I showed you a few of my uh, Polaroid pics. I have my little 11th uh, birthday here. I am in uh, my birthday cake, my 11th birthday. Um, then I'm here on my little Shetland pony. That's been kind of a little birthday fun time there. Then I'm there with my brother Mark and friend David. Mark's on our Palomino, uh, my older brother, and then David, great friend, uh, were there. Then I, I kind of grabbed a couple of other ones here. This is a garden center my dad started when he was an entrepreneur curler back in the 60s called Dick's Garden Center. Uh, his name was Dick, but he used the DIX for his business and uh, did a lot of different things. Kind of a little memory there. Um, this old pickup. There's a picture of my sister, a uh, little Polaroid pic. Uh, she's in her bedroom there with wallpaper. The actual wallpaper was graffiti out of the 60s. I can remember, you know, here come the judge, you know, flower power. Uh, when they passed out noses, you thought they said roses, so you asked for a big red one. <laughs> I remember that as a kid. That's quite a memory to have, isn't it? And then... My grandpa Dan, he was my favorite. He was a hero of mine, my mother's dad. Uh, we did a lot of great things together. Kind of have that little picture of him there. They used to call me Little Dan when I was a little tyke. And you know, some of those things, you kind of look at the process. But um, here's kind of how it works. Uh, our personal journeys are a lot like the old Polaroid process. You know, I've got a little Polaroid camera here. Uh, the process is that when you take the picture, then it come out and it develops over a little bit of time and then you see the full exposure. So many things we experience presently in our lives are not what they're thought or perceived to be. What we see is the picture or the photo in a moment of time with our limited viewpoint. In reality, life is made up of many individual moments and events, some of which we understand and, and some we don't. Some of which uh, we would like to last forever and others we'd like to pass very quickly. Some we want to revisit and others not so much because they're too painful. Our challenge, as we said in the previous weeks, we walk by faith and not by sight, not by human reasoning, but by divine Revelation. So it's really how we view our present picture with a proper perspective that enables us to move forward. So as believers, we can learn to embrace these pits of life 
and overcome the obstacles that they present. So we, we hit these obstacles, but we can overcome them by allowing them to fully develop little by little, or what I like to call the polarized process, experiences coming into full focus. So the first thing to remember is, as it develops, is reality. There are pits in life. Life is full of pits. Joseph's dream seemingly turned into a nightmare. His brothers threw him into a pit. It was real, unexpected, and uh, unprepared for event. He wasn't ready for that. But just remember, things don't always turn out just right all the time for most of us. Welcome to the club. You're there. Secondly, the second reminder as it develops is a reason. The pit was used by God to get Joseph from where he was to where he intended him to go or where he wanted him to be. God wants you to be where he wants you to be more than you want to be where God wants you to be. And he knows how to set up the dynamics for that to happen. Like a stormy wind fulfilling his word. The scripture talks about a stormy wind fulfilling his word. All things work together for the good for those who love God, for those who are the call according to his purpose in Romans chapter 8. Do you believe that? Do you really believe this? God sees what you cannot see. So we have reality, we have reason, and the third reminder is it develops is the response. Even though Joseph pleads and cries out, he's sold into slavery, he cannot seem to get to the power of God to move for him, you know, I prayed, I prayed, nothing's happening. Joseph's response is one of absolute trust and faithfulness to God. You see, his experience, some major highs, lows, hills, valleys, he remains faithful. Did he have disappointment? You bet he did. Yet he was found faithful, still found faithful. He somehow was able to keep a proper perspective, and that's what I want you to be doing as well. And then lastly, the fourth reminder is that as it develops is a result. Pits bear fruit. They're like seeds, you know, you think of that, that big seed within the plum or the peach, you know, you, you kind of look at that and say, they bear fruit. The exposure now developed through the experience of the pits of his life take on a full porn, uh, a panoramic, full picture of, of a, um, a full color meaning. So you see, you see like the panoramic fullness of of God's outpouring in his life, and you see that his sheaf rises up, and he interprets Pharaoh's dream. He's put second in charge of Egypt, and he devises a plan to save Egypt from famine. His brother's sheaves bow to his, and even his father's sheaf bows to his. We, you know, we need to enjoy the journey of our lives. Trust God in all circumstances and leave the developing of the picture up to God. Joseph could have been very vindictive to his brothers. He could have caused them uh, severe pain and even torment. And they would have never known who he was. They would have known it. But because he developed these negative, negative exposures um, of the pits of his life, he had some Polaroid process, we call it, or Polaroid pictures, kind of the full the full revelation uh, of God's will of his life. He's able to save Egypt and his nation and Israel as well. So what an example for us to follow. The question is, will we do as he did? Uh, I believe we can. I believe we can. I really do. So we can ask for life without the pits, but in reality, the pits are part of life. That doesn't sound like good news, does it? That doesn't sound like good news to me. I don't, I don't like to hear it, but it's true. In most cases, we can't see the purpose or the reason now, but let's let them fully develop. Like Samson's story, let's let the sweetness come forth out of the eater in our lives. After some time, the Bible says. After some time. The uniquenesses of God, he can take bitter experiences and turn them into honey, and they're sweet. Often you'll find a rich deposit of treasure in unlikely places and in unlikely people. Some of the sweetest people I know have come through some of the hardest trials 
terrible things. And I look and I think that's amazing to me. You know, these blessings grow in appreciation and value with time. Ask yourself, have you been walking through any pits lately? When you look at the pictures of our lives, what parts do you tend to want to cut out? If you could take the picture, what do you want to cut out? Because they didn't seem to have a purpose. What do we want and why do we want them removed? When you look at the picture of your life, understand that God is developing the process into the full picture. You and I, all of us, are a work in progress. The one who began a good work in you can bring it forth to full completion. I understand today that you can't remove the pits, only walk through them, and by God's grace, his grace will be sufficient for you. Uh, remember Paul? He prayed this prayer. Uh, please remove this thorn in the flesh, and, and he wanted it soon. Kind of a little closing here. And lest I should be exalted above measures through the abundance of the revelations, this is Paul, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I, I besought the Lord three times, that it might depart from me. I really prayed about this, that it might leave me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather, I, I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I love what C.M. Ward said. This thorn may have been Paul's strongest link to Jesus, that I might know him in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. In what ways? Just think about that. Could you enjoy and learn to enjoy the journey of your life and leave the development unto God. What could you do to change your perspective? To think of it in terms of not one event, but many events come together and God ultimately leading you by his hand. The Polaroid process. Let's let it happen in our lives. I want you to pray with me and let's believe God. Lord, we think of Paul who Lord, you gave a word. My grace is sufficient for thee. Lord, I pray for each and every person to say, God, your grace, it's not only saving and sustaining, it's sufficient for every circumstance that we're in. Lord, that we would see, God, that maybe we're going through a test or a testing, but we're going to come through with a testimony. Lord, often people don't know the process of what it took for some people to arrive where they're at, even like a Joyce Meyer or even Joseph, who a Lord was in a pit, sold into slavery, and eventually he reigned in a palace. But God, there was a process, and it was a long one and a hard one. But God, we're faithful to see him through. Lord, I pray in every circumstance that we would trust you and know, God, that if God be for us, who could be against us?